Hey, everybody, it's time for question and answer time. Look, I love hearing from you. I love your questions. Oftentimes, they're the exact same questions I get from my patients. So let's dive in. If you're ready, I'm ready. Number one, from at meats, salt, and water. I bet you're a carnivore guy. I dislocated my shoulder really bad. What should I eat to make it recover stronger? Are there any supplements I should be taking for healing? Well, I'm sorry to hear that you did that. The deal is all the collagen supplements in the world are probably not going to help you heal your shoulder. And if I'm reading your site, Meat, Salt, and Water, right, you're probably getting a lot of collagen in your diet already. But what most people unfortunately don't know is that vitamin C is critical for knitting collagen together. And vitamin C, we don't manufacture. So you have to swallow it. The problem with vitamin C, it's a water-soluble vitamin. And when you swallow a vitamin C, it's gone in about three or four hours. So my recommendation to you, and I actually do this with the patients that I operate on or did operate on, I have them take 1,000 milligrams of timed-release vitamin C twice a day. That'll give you a continuous supply of vitamin C to re-knit all that collagen that you need to repair your shoulder. And you've heard me say again, vitamin D is the nether critical part of that. Make sure you're taking anywhere from five to 10,000 international units of vitamin D3 a day. I like to supplement it with vitamin K2, at least 100 micrograms a day. And feel better. This is from at carm.de. Thoughts about eating pasta imported from Italy made with Italian flour. Well, here's the deal. Most, uh, sadly, after the war in Ukraine, uh, a great deal of the wheat available in Europe was no longer available. And I have it with good sources that Italy now imports a great deal of its flour from the United States. And since almost all of our wheat is sprayed with glyphosate, just importing Italian pasta is probably not the safest thing to do. Particularly now, there are great pastas made out of sorghum flour. I make one here at Gundry MD, but, and there's millet pasta. There are great alternative pastas, so you really don't need to import your pasta from Italy. Great question, though. This one's from at luda.sha. How to get rid of toenail fungus. So you wouldn't believe how many people have toenail fungus. Uh, almost everyone I operated on back when I was a heart surgeon had toenail fungus. Sadly, it's really, really, really difficult to get rid of toenail fungus. First of all, please, please, please do not take an oral antifungal agent. I personally have seen several people develop liver failure from this. When I was a transplant surgeon, we did liver transplants for people who had taken antifungals to treat their toenail fungus. So please don't do that. Laser treatment will work, but interestingly, the number of patients I've had who've had their toenails treated with laser, eventually the toenail fungus came back. So in general, it's almost a losing cause. From at Steph.any, if your gut is completely healed, can you still have food sensitivities? Absolutely. I have a number of patients whose guts are completely healed. They have absolutely no markers of leaky gut. And yet when we measure their food sensitivities, certain foods remain as a sensitive food. Now, a lot of them, a lot of their food sensitivities completely resolve. But a number of people and most of these people knew that they had this food sensitivity even when we started. So just because your leaky gut is healed 
doesn't mean that there's certain foods that you should still avoid. The good news is, like I say, most of my patients know what foods those are, and they just naturally avoid them, or they, for instance, pressure cook them. So the good news is for most of my patients who might have a two-page list of moderate and severe food sensitivities, they might be down to two or three in the end. In fact, we just had a patient this week who is now literally down to one food sensitivity. Happens to be almonds. Started off with almonds, but most of the time they'll resolve. But just because your gut is healed doesn't mean you'll completely avoid food sensitivities. From at E-Z-A-R-L-E-N-G, what is the deal with appeal coating on avocados? Should I stay away from buying these? Well, again, this is a, this is a treatment that's being applied to apples, to avocados, to keep the moisture in. Now, the deal is with an avocado, luckily, you're going to throw the peel away. And you're going to scoop out the insides. So no, in avocado, that's not a big deal. But with apples or other fruits, to me, that is a big deal. And apples are, quite frankly, one of the highest fructose-containing fruits there is. So just be cautious when you see that treated with a vegetable coating or treated with a coating or treated with a peel... There's far better fruits to buy, like blackberries or raspberries or kiwi. Great question. From at Studio L by Liz, can you clear up the confusion with kale? Is it good for you or bad for you? What about oxalate content? Well, good question. I'm actually uh, going to produce a YouTube all about this subject because it is very controversial. I'll give you a quick answer. A kale, like other brassica vegetables, uh, likes to concentrate a heavy metal called cadmium in its leaves. And if you're Dave Asprey, you hate uh, kale anyhow, and cadmium may not be very good for you, but I do heavy metal testing in a lot of my patients, and cadmium actually rarely shows up as a major issue for most of my patients. However, kale does have a lot of oxalates. Sadly, a great number of us no longer have oxalate-eating bacteria. And so if you are one of those people who are sensitive to oxalates, that's because you don't have that class of bacteria. Now, the good news is that we're now learning that there are class of bacteria in the biofilm of olives and also in pickle juice, which will actually help reconstitute those oxalate-eating bacteria. And that's maybe another reason why olives are so good for you. Who knew that there was a biofilm in olives that might help you handle oxalates? Interestingly enough, all of my oxalate-sensitive patients, once we get their leaky gut fit and their microbiome more diverse, they're no longer sensitive to oxalates. I hope that answers your question. From at Ira.Nchiva, how do you fast yet not lose weight for people who are already too thin? That is actually a really good question, and that is true with my patients as well. There are absolutely some of my patients who are very thin to start with, who embark on intermittent fasting, and absolutely cannot keep weight on. It's in general because you are uncoupling your mitochondria even more than what you've already done. Most thin people actually have very uncoupled mitochondria. What I like to do with my individuals like this is I look at their fasting insulin levels, I look at their HOMA IR, H O M A dash IR, and I look at their insulin like growth factors. If those are all in great shape, then you don't need intermittent fasting to add to your regimen. It's not going to benefit you any further. 
But just remember that 50% of normal weight individuals in the United States are metabolically inflexible. 88% of overweight individuals are metabolically inflexible. And 98% of obese individuals are metabolically inflexible. So for the vast majority of everyone, intermittent fasting is very, very useful. Finally, if you are thinking about getting pregnant, uh, intermittent fasting is not for you because it literally sends signals to you that times are rough, that you might not be getting adequate food and probably not a good time to have a baby, pop an egg up. Okay, this is at Forever Health Journey. Even though I take magnesium, I sometimes still get cramps, especially in my feet. Not sure what that means I'm lacking. Well, so it sounds from your handle that Forever Health Journey, you may be working on intermittent fasting. And one of the things we know about intermittent fasting, or even fasting for a day or so, is that you actually increase your uric acid and you deplete not only magnesium from your muscles, but also potassium. So one of the tricks, number one, is make sure you are consuming an electrolyte solution. I make one called Vital Recharge. I happen to love Element. My wife takes Element every day. So there are multiple electrolyte options. Number two, most of my patients, we have to give them potassium, magnesium, aspartate, not just magnesium. That usually solves the problem. Finally, I do have a few patients, even on that regimen, that still get cramps. I've found that you can use magnesium oil spray. Now, magnesium oil is not an oil, but it feels greasy. It's just liquid magnesium. It's like Epsom salts. And you just spray it on your legs or your feet. And that's actually been very, very effective. Finally, some people have noticed that apple cider vinegar is actually very useful for cramps. And if you haven't tried it, please try it. Okay, from at I Love Lucy Lover. She's pretty funny. Uh, been drinking three to four cans of sparkling water, Spindrift and LaCroix for two months. Now I have sky-high albuminuria and elevated A1C. Can this be related? No, uh, that would not be related to this. But let me tell you, sky-high albuminuria and elevated A1C is directly related to sugar and or uric acid damaging your kidneys. And come and see me, we'll fix it. More amazing episodes just like this one. Watch now. Can a person who was once metabolically flexible become inflexible again? If yes, what are the conditions? Oh, brother, is it easy to become metabolically inflexible? 